right. Welcome everyone to another edition of College of Science virtual seminar. Uh, good to see everybody today. Um, today we have uh, Professor Manny Gabbett from the Department of Geology at San Jose State University. Uh, a little background on Manny. Uh, let me see if I can get my facts right here. Um, so Manny um, got his uh, bachelor's in anthropology um, from UC Berkeley, uh, then went uh, again to UC Berkeley for an MA in geography, and then a PhD in geography, uh, sorry, in geology um, from UC Santa Barbara um, back in 2002. Um, he did a short postdoctoral stint at UC Santa Barbara at the Institute for Crustal Studies, which I think is an awesome name for a, a program. Um, held a couple of different teaching positions before joining San Jose State in 2007 as an assistant professor in the geology department, and he's been with us ever since. Uh, one little fun fact about Manny, which he wanted me to share, was that um, several years back, he garnered a three quarter of a page write up in the stodgy old magazine, The Economist, uh, which was the most read story on the BBC website for at least a couple of hours. Um, and I believe some of the stuff that was covered in that story is going to be the subject of his talk today. Um, just a little bit uh, on our ground rules for everyone who um, needs a reminder. Um, if you have a question uh, about Manny's talk, go ahead and type your question either in the Q&A or the chat. I'll be monitoring that during the talk. If it looks like something that Manny should be interrupted for, I'll go ahead and interrupt him. Otherwise, we'll hold the questions to the end of the talk and uh, let you ask your question and let Manny answer the question uh, live. Um, so without further ado, um, Manny, tell us about MEMA Mountains, a case study in crypto topography. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, so before I begin, thank, thank you to Michael and, and Mary for inviting me and, and also for Kim for uh, uh, arranging the, the details. Uh, so there, there's kind of a, a funny postscript to the BBC story. Yeah, so my uh, there was a write-up on the research I'm about to show you on the BBC website, and uh, it was the number, it was a top most read story for a few hours, but then I got knocked off the first place by um, because Winnie Mandela died. And so th that's what it took to, to get my story off. Uh, so anyways, let me share my screen. Um, my screen sharing is paused. I can see your screen, Manny. Okay. Um, can you, is it the full screen or the? Um, so it's still in um, like preview mode. So I can see your main slide, but I can also see the slides oh. on the side. Oh, right. Okay. So yeah. Um, uh, let's see. How does this work again to do this right? Um, There's, there's one option you can try, which is um, if you go into screen sharing and then click on the advanced tab, Yeah. Um, you can choose a portion of the screen. So you could just choose the main slide block as what you, there you go. Okay. Well, Looks I good. Would... Now, now I just see one slide. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, okay. So whatever uh... you did, whatever you did worked. <laughs> okay. Um... <clears throat> And so, yeah, but it, but it's weird. It's not it's not showing the whole thing. Sorry, God. You know, you would think after doing this for for two semesters because of COVID. Uh, so try try that um, uh, that advanced sharing button. So click click on the screen sharing, and then there's a tab at the top that says advanced. Yeah, but but it's not. I I see what it's showing. But can I change? Oh, okay. Yeah, so you can pull, oh, you can change the borders. Okay, there we go. Okay, okay, so that that should work. Okay, um, 
so yeah, so solving the mystery of the Mima Mounds. So I didn't do all this work by myself. I, I had help from, from a couple of co-authors, Taylor and, and Don Johnson that you can see there. Um, so what are Mima Mounds? Well, there are these uh, small hillocks that are about one to two meters high, about seven to 10 meters in diameter. Uh, so you can see a bunch of them here in this Mima Mound field. You can see uh, even more here. This is the Mima Mount Prairie in Washington. This is actually the, the type site for these features. Uh, you can see there's you know thousands of them in, in this picture. So that's up in Washington. This is down in San Diego. And you can see all these little mounds. These are also called pimple mounds. And you can see they just look like little pimples on the landscape. Here's a freeway down here for, for scale. <clears throat> here, uh, another nice meme mount field. This is in the Carrizo Plain, which is uh, maybe a couple hours east of San Luis Obispo. Uh, and if you're a geologist, you might notice that the San Andreas Fault actually cuts through the, the top third of this picture. So this, I'm showing the San Andreas Fault, if you can see my cursor move through. And you can see Wallace Creek here uh, being offset by, um, by, the, uh, by the fault. But you know, what's really interesting here is not the fault, who cares about that? It's all these Mima Mounds. And again, you can see all these little pimples in the landscape. Those are just thousands and thousands of Mima Mounds. Here's a nice uh, view of a terrace in Yakima, Washington. And again, you just see these little mounds everywhere. <clears throat> so back to the Central Valley, this is probably where they're known the best, probably where there, there used to be the, the greatest number of them. So this is near Merced. And this is LIDAR uh, imagery and all of these little bumps, these are all new mounds. And this is just a small portion of this much larger area. And so there's a minimum of like minimum of 100 square kilometers uh, of area through here just covered by mounds. So you know thousands if not millions of these Mima mounds just in in this area. And um, oh you know what I'm realizing that if I do my share this way um, all the anima none of the animations are going to work. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do this the right way. Um, so okay. let me... Yeah, take, take the time you need. We want to get it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, God, there was a way to do this and I can't remember. Are you, um, are you using two screens? No, no, I'm just using one screen. But as soon as, so, you know, if I if I hit the sh do the presentation, it pauses the. Oh, maybe if I go back up. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, there we go. That worked, right? Looks good. Yep, looks good. Okay, good. That's a relief. Okay. Um, so this is so so in a, kind of the, the brown shading here. This shows uh, kind of a general map of Mima Mounds in the United States. So you can see pretty much the West and the central US has Mima Mounds or features that look like Mima Mounds. And in fact, um, Mima Mounds are found on all continents except Antarctica. Okay, so these are uh, uh, pervasive throughout the world. <clears throat> so here's a, 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 another view of them and uh, what you'll notice, so, so a couple interesting things. So first of all, you'll notice water accumulating here in between the mounds. And so these are vernal pools. And um, as some of you may know, vernal pools are a kind of um, rare habitat now in the Central Valley. It, they used to be a much more pervasive. And they are habitat for endangered species like, um, like the fairy shrimp. Now, another thing you might notice about this picture is that um, <clears throat> there's a sharp dividing line 
between these Mio mounds on the right and then this flat surface on the left. And you might think, well, that's, that's kind of weird. That can't possibly be natural and, and you'd be right. Um, <clears throat> because a lot of these Mio mounds existed in areas that were also uh, prime land for farming and agriculture. And, and so when farmers moved to the Central Valley, they invented this thing called the Fresno scraper. And this was a special device that was designed to basically level the fields and, and destroy the Mima Mounds. And so this is, this is a view of uh, the Fresno scraper at work, obviously not on a Mima Mound, but um, you get the idea that if you're a farmer and you wanted to level your field, that this is how you would do it. <clears throat> now, of course, the big question that uh, you should all be asking yourselves is how were they created? The, the first person to actually publish on this was uh, Commodore Charles Wilkes. He was the commander of an expedition um, kind of sponsored by the US Navy. This was in the, the, the middle of the 19th century where they had this big expedition throughout the Pacific Basin to kind of map things. And, and, and see what was going on. This was, you know, during the early years of, uh, of the United States. Most of the action was happening in the East. They didn't really know what was happening in the West. And so this expedition uh, was, was to explore the, the Pacific Basin. Now, one of the kind of the interesting outcomes of this expedition was that they discovered Antarctica. But even more interesting than that was that they went to check out some Mima Mounds. The, com the Commander Wilkes had heard about these strange features uh, near Puget Sound, which is in Washington State. So they made a special detour to the Mima Mound Prairie, which is uh, which I showed you a picture of earlier. And uh, he had his men dig into three of them to try to figure out how they formed. And, and you can see down here at the, at the bottom right, there's kind of a picture that he drew in his report. And <clears throat> After digging into these things and thinking about it for a bit, he determined that they bear the marks of human labor and are such an undertaking as would have required the united efforts of a whole tribe. So he thought that these had been uh, or, or were being created by the, um, the, the indigenous people there, possibly as, as burial mounds. <clears throat> Other hypotheses that emerged since then so Louis Agassiz, uh, who discovered the ice ages, thought that they were the nest of a species of sucker, which is a, a type of fish. The brother of Alfred R. Wallace, who some of you might remember as the Dakota Scar Revolution, his opinion was that they were formed by uh, innumerable rills that issued from the retiring ice sheet. And uh, th there have been a, other, a bunch of other hypotheses that have been proposed. So for example, that these mean mounds are formed by wind erosion, by the venting of gas, subsurface gas, by artesian pressure being released, by earthquakes, giant roots, and of course, aliens. So this is a, 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 um, a reference I, I found. This is a book called Ex Extraterrestrial, Extraterrestrial Intervention. And there was a short chapter or article in there uh, called the Mima Mounds. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, uh, get a copy of this. I'm sure it would have been compelling reading. <clears throat> Another theory that, that came about in the 1940s was called the fossorial rodent hypothesis. And so, uh, and, and, and this hypothesis was based on kind of the basic observation that on top of these Mima Mounds, so uh, if you can see my cursor, I'm kind of outlining one of these Mima Mounds, there's uh, ample evidence of gopher activity. If you've ever had gophers on, in your lawn, or if you've noticed gopher activity on, on a hike, uh, you're gonna recognize uh, kind of the spoils of, of um, uh, this gopher activity. Gophers, of course, are fossorial animals, which means that they live in the soil and um, they, they dig these extensive burrow networks. Some of these, uh, uh, they dig some chambers where they store food, they dig other chambers for, for nesting. 
but but mostly, whoops, mostly what they're doing is they're bur constantly burrowing because that's how they get their food. So they're eating the uh, below ground plant parts, you know, the roots and so on. And so they constantly have to dig to for for food. <clears throat> And so the idea is with this, with this hypothesis is um, that these mounds, one of the observations was that these mounds seem to form in areas where there's a hard pan uh, below the soil. So we, we see, uh, so kind of in orange here, we've got a layer of soil over this hard pan. Uh, and then we've got kind of a little vegetation here to, to show you the perspective. Now the thing with hard pan, so, so hard pan is a layer in the soil that develops over time that um, it kind of in the most extreme case is, is like a layer of concrete in the soil. And so the idea is that when it rains, the, the rainwater is unable to infiltrate through the hard pan and you get this perched water table that essentially saturates the soil. Now, if you're a gopher living in that soil, you get saturated too and, and you drown. So clearly, um, this is a bad situation for gophers. <clears throat> and so the hypothesis was that the gophers have somehow figured out that if they push the soil into mounds, when it rains, there will be a part of the mound, the top of the mound will remain dry. And, and that way the, the gophers will live to or see another day. And so, so the, the, the creation of the mounds then is just a, a really a re, just a response to seasonally saturated soils. And, and that's what uh, underpinned this, this theory that the gophers had created the mounds. <clears throat> um, there we go. So we know that gophers can push soil downhill. So this is a, this is a, this is a picture I took you can see there's a lot of gopher activity. Uh, the, the, uh, there's these gopher tunnels here on, on the side of this road cut. And you can see just all the soil being pushed out of, of these, um, out of the tunnels. And when you think about it energetically, of course it makes sense for gophers to push soil downhill rather than uphill. And, and so one of the kind of the key questions in this hypothesis was, well, do gophers actually push soil uphill? And so um, there was an interesting study that was done where they had set out uh, a number of magnetic tracers, so kind of represented here by these black dots, throughout a MEMA mound field. And so they just set them out and uh, they came back maybe a year later to figure out, whoops, to figure out where these tracers um, had been moved. You know, if it was if um, if the great if if the gophers were able to push the soil uphill, you might find that these these tracers also had been pushed uphill. So that was kind of the idea. So, <clears throat> oops. Uh, so so they came back a, a a year later. They used a metal detector to figure out where these tracers were, and they came up with some very interesting data. So on the x-axis is transport distance. And on the y-axis is elevation. So the transport distance here, so positive numbers, that's distance, that's transport towards the center of the mound. Okay, so which is here in um, shown with the dashed line. Uh, and, and then negative numbers, that's transport distance away from the mound. So what we see is that at lower elevations, so that means uh, you know, further away from the center of the mound, the tracers were pushed uh, uh, the furthest distance towards the center, okay? And then as you go higher in, higher in elevation, which essentially means as you go further up the mound, you know, or closer to the center of the mound, transport distances decrease, okay? So the further away uh, these tracers were from the mound, the, the, uh, the further they were pushed towards the center of the mound. And there was one tracer. Um, <clears throat> that was pushed uh, away from the center of the mound, and that was the one that had started off at the top of the mound. 
Okay, so, um, so so we see this net transport of 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 soil of tracers and soil towards the center of the mound, but uh, you know that's balanced somewhat by soil at the top of the mound is being pushed away from the center of the mound, and of course that makes sense because um, if you didn't have this data point right here, it would suggest that mounds just get infinitely taller and taller and taller. So so there's 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 a balance between soil being pushed towards the middle and and soil being pushed uh, away from the middle. So just to kind of summarize what that means, kind of more graphically. <clears throat> so um, the, the the arrow represents the distance that the 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 the, the soil was transported, and so so again, kind of near the bottom of the mound, you had. Uh, um, a greater transport distance, but as you get towards the top of the mound, transport distances decrease. Uh, but we see that the soil is pushed uphill towards the mound center and that that soil is pushed um, a distance inversely proportional to elevation. Um, and soil at the top of the mound actually gets pushed uh, away from the uh, away from the center of the mound and, and towards kind of downhill. <clears throat> and uh, another interesting result from from that tracer study was that even tracers or soil that were at distances from five to seven meters away from the mound were still being pushed towards the mound. So so that means that even gophers that were seven meters away from the mound we're still able to orient their pushing activity towards the center of the mound. And so what this suggests then is that gophers can sense high spots from far away. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Well, so first of all, first of all we know that gophers live in the mounds. We also have evidence that gophers can maintain the mounds. So that tracer study, all that tracer study showed was that the gophers can maintain the mounds, but can gophers actually build the mounds? Now, it turns out uh, <clears throat> the creation of these mounds seems to take decades to centuries. Uh, and, and so it's very difficult to convince a graduate student to grab a lawn chair and uh, just sit out in the middle of the field for 50 years and, and make measurements. And so one way to speed up time is to do that with a numerical model. And, and so that's what I did. So what I did is I created an artificial landscape, a synthetic landscape, and I populated it with uh, synthetic robot gophers. And I, taught, and I taught these gophers how to behave. And so the gophers followed these rules. So first of all, um, the gopher looks around and uh, looks for the nearest high spot and pushes soil towards that, the, that nearest high spot. Now, this part's a little tricky because um, you can imagine that if you're a gopher and you're just sticking your head out of the ground, you may not see this big mound over here because your view is blocked by the smaller mound. So I had to teach, I had to uh, basically, um, calibrate gopher vision, if you want to think about it that way, <clears throat> such that uh, the high spots, well, so, so, so the issue, yeah, is that high spots further away are less likely to be sensed. And so the, there's this weighting function whereby um, <clears throat> this may be the actual elevation, but this is what the gopher sees. And again, this has to do with the fact that, you know, their vision is going to be blocked because they're just sticking their head out Gophers don't like to walk around the surface because they're easy prey. They have terrible vision. They don't see very well. Um, they don't like being on the surface. And uh, so they just stick their heads out of the holes. And so if you're sticking your head out of the hole, that you're just going to see the, the nearest mound. And so uh, these robot gophers, I had to adjust their vision to, to account for that. So, so the elevations in the model are weighted according to where the gopher is. And it turns out that the weighting function actually controls the diameter of the mounds. So the further they can see, the larger the mounds, um, and the more 
kind of nearsighted they are, the, the smaller the mounds. <clears throat> the other rule that these gophers had to follow was that the transport distance is inversely proportional to elevation. So the amount, so the distance that they push the soil depends on where they are on the mound. And, and again, you know, that uh, uh, if you recall the, the data that I showed you, it showed that there was a pretty good, a strong inverse, purport, uh, inverse relationship between transport distance and, and elevation. And then there's also a gravity rule. And the gravity rule accounts for all the other processes that might transport soil. And um, these are all kind of subsumed under the kind of the soil creep um, label. And, and soil creep generally just moves soil downhill. So, so in addition to gophers moving the soil around, there's also soil creep uh, uh, pushing soil downhill. Uh, kind of in a, in a chronic fashion. <clears throat> okay, so just to sum up what these rules look like graphically. So if the gopher is far away from the, the mound, the gopher or the, the Mima mound, it's gonna push the soil um, uh, a pretty good distance. If the gopher is already a little bit higher in elevation on the mound, that transport distance is going to be a little less. And then uh, there's soil creep always happening in the background, pushing soil downhill. OK, so gophers are pushing soil uphill. Soil creep is pushing soil downhill. And so you know, as you can imagine, over time, you get to a steady state. So this is what the, 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 the numerical model looks like. Um, in cross section. So this is just a, a profile. And so the, the model space is um, initially roughened with just a little bit of topographic noise. So it's, it's essentially a flat surface roughened with this random topographic noise. The, the, the model domain that we're looking at here, so this is in, uh, um, 10 meters horizontally and, and one meter vertically. And I'm gonna um, focus your attention on this little bit of uh, roughness on the soil surface right there. What's gonna happen is uh, because this spot is just a little bit higher than the other spots, the gophers are gonna be moving the soil towards this spot. And you're gonna see that over time, this little hill, uh, you know, the expression of making a mountain out of a molehill. Well, it's just the opposite here. A mountain is gonna be formed out of this, this, little, this little hill here. Keep track of the time here on, uh, in, in, the in, the, in, the, in the right upper corner. It goes slow for about the first 50 years and, th and, then, it, and then it speeds up. Okay, so here we go. And now I, I didn't, uh, there's no gophers that are animated here. Hey, Manny, um, the screen went black. Oh, the screen went black. I don't know whether that's something animation related or not. Yeah, let's see. Okay, that's critical. Um, okay, so bear with me. I can do something about that. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna have to. Okay. There we go. I can see that now. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna pause it for just a second. Um, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna back it up. <clears throat> okay, so so you see this main mound forming in the middle. Uh, but there was this kind of a uh, smaller mount here that also formed, you know, and, and, and again, this has to do with the fact that um, sometimes the gophers can't see the big mound because it's being blocked by the smaller mound. But watch what happens to this smaller mound over time.
so after about 500 years, we reach a, a steady state situation. Oh, and it just disappears. Um, but what you'll notice is that that, that smaller mound disappeared. And, and essentially what happens is um, it got cannibalized by, by the larger mound. And, and, and this, this will become even more clear in the next animation, which also probably won't work. So let me go back to, <coughs> oops. Um, let's see. Okay, so, uh, shoot, hold on. I can't get to my controls. It's blocked by the. Okay, sorry, I'm going to have to start this over again <clears throat> just so I can explain what we're looking at. Um, okay, so, so, uh, so, so now this is, we're looking at this from above. This is exactly the same model as I showed you uh, just a second ago, but, but now it's, it's the entire model space and we're looking at it from above. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, so we have distance on both the X and, and the Y axis. Uh, if you're wondering why this is in decimeters, this is one of those things where it seemed like a good idea right when I was starting to code the model. And then 2000 lines later, I realized it was a dumb idea, but it was much too late to, to change. So this is, uh, this is basically a 40 meter model space. So 40 meters uh, on each side. And elevation is, is shown, is represented by, by contour lines. So if, you, if you've looked at a contour line before, you know, like a topographic map, um, you'll understand what this means, but, but the colors represent um, uh, areas of equal elevation. And so this is right at the beginning of the model. And so everything's just kind of flat. Uh, again, it's just this uh, surface uh, roughened by topographic noise, but pretty quickly you'll see uh, um, kind of mound things start to form. So I'm gonna get this started. Okay, so I'm gonna pause it here. Uh, hopefully now you can see the, the contour lines a, a little bit more clearly. So, so clearly red is the, the high elevation. And then as we uh, transition into through the greens and the blues, we get to lower and lower elevations. So you can see the mounds already starting to form. Of course, everything's kind of square because that's just how things work in, in a grid. Soil can only be moved in, in, in eight directions. So, so it, uh, uh, it starts off looking a little bit wonky and a little bit squarish, but, but, but they, they round off. <clears throat> okay, so that's after about 40 years. And then again, it's, it's gonna speed up. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna pause it here and I'm gonna highlight something. So no, you'll, you'll notice that some of these mounds, like this one right here, that I'm showing with my arrow, this one right here, they're being pulled apart. They're being cannibalized by the adjoining mounds. So this mound here is, is essentially being torn apart by, by, by these three mounds. This mound right here is being cannibalized by its three neighbors. This mound right here being cannibalized by its three neighbors. So as, as you watch this, you'll notice that there is a kind of a consolidation whereby the weak mounds are being cannibalized and consumed by, by the larger mounds. And it's kind of weird to be talking about the mounds as if they have agency, um, but in a way they do because gophers only live two or three years, but it takes decades to centuries for these mounds to form. And so, um, so these mounds actually do kind of take on a, a life of their own in a way. They, 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 serve. they live much, much longer than the gophers do, and they keep evolving long after, you know, each of the, each of the gophers has died. <clears throat> so that was, uh, so I'm go back to this just to point something out. 
uh, it, it's it's so okay. So there, ah, it's so annoying that the player just okay. So you'll see the year eight sixty. So it's taken about a thousand years for this meme amount field to fully develop. And, and so again, you know, that, that's way, way longer than the lifespan of an individual, individual gopher. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to this. Great, it worked. So now if I take my model results and, and, and I do a pretty hill shade map on it, it looks like this. Uh, and um, <clears throat> which looks pretty close to a, a real Mima mountain field. So, so for example, here is, uh, you can see a, a Mima mountain field conveniently in black and white. And um, you know, it's undeniable that the, the computer model has created something that looks like what's happening in, in the real world. <clears throat> And I can even add, I can flood the model a little bit, add some water, and boom, we have vernal pools that are also forming in, uh, uh, in between the mountains. <clears throat> so this cannibaliz cannibalization of, of mounds uh, deserves a, a little bit of extra attention. Because when I first saw this happening in the model, uh, I didn't believe it. I thought, well, this is this is some weird model behavior that cannot possibly be real. Nobody had ever observed this happening in the real world. Nobody had ever hypothesized that it happened in the real world. Um, and so I was, as I was watching this happen, I was already in my mind trying to figure out how I was going to rationalize this clearly unrealistic behavior in the model when it came to, to, to writing the paper. And so I was, uh, one day I was feeling kind of despondent about it. And I came across, I was just reading like some old papers. And I came across this map, this topo map that somebody had made of a Mima Mound field. And uh, I was just staring at it and noticed, oops, <laughs> that. So what you can see here uh, in, 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 the magenta oval, in the magenta oval is something that looks like the uh, cannibalization that I saw, that we just saw in the numerical model. I saw that one and then I saw this one over here. I was like, oh, wait a second. Not only does this look rare, but it looks kind of common. And what's, and, and I get goosebumps just thinking about this, but compare that with the model right here. So this is just a snippet from the model I just showed you. It looks exactly um, exactly the same, right? It's just kind of flipped, the, the image is flipped, but uh, it, this is absolutely uncanny. And, um, and, you know, for a numerical modeler, this is, uh, you know, this is the holy grail where you've developed a computer model based on just a few simple rules, just a couple equations, and you end up discovering something about the real world that nobody had ever noticed before and nobody would ever notice, would never ever be able to notice because it takes so long. These things take thousands of years to form. And unless you uh, discovered this in a computer model, you would never, we would never know about it. So, so again, this is one of those cool instances where the model shows you something completely new about the world. So qualitatively, the, you know, the model looks like it's doing a pretty good job of um, simulating the real world and simulating gopher behavior and, and meme malformation. But what about quantitatively? So we tested the model in, in a few ways. So the model predicts that after about 35 years, um, a mound should be about 25 centimeters high. <clears throat> And we can test that in the field. So this is this is the Carrizo Plain. I showed you pictures of this area before. And you can see uh, just a bunch of meme mounds everywhere. They, they've got the, the kind of the greener grass on top of them. So this area was farmed until the 1980s. And as a result of that farming activity, they had leveled 
these fields, these fields are perfectly flat. Um, and then in the 1980s, this area got turned into a national monument. The farmers were kicked off. And since then, these mounds have slowly been growing and emerging uh, from what used to be a completely flat landscape. So since I knew when these mounds had started to form, I, I could go out there and survey their heights. So here I uh, enlisted my son. We went out there one December and surveyed a bunch of these emerging mounds. And since I knew, you know, we were able to get their average height, I knew when the mounds started growing, I was able to calculate their growth rate and um, <clears throat> found that after 30 years, they had grown about 24 centimeters. So I consider that a win. <clears throat> the model predicts that the mound heights should be, the final mound heights should be on average about 85 centimeters. When we, uh, measure these things in the field. The, the, the mounds range from about 0.1 to 2 meter high. So I also consider that a win. And then the final thing that we looked at was a spatial arrangement. <clears throat> so uh, think about it this way. So, so imagine if the actual arrangement of the mounds looks like what we see here on the, on the left side of the screen. But imagine that the model uh, predicted that the arrangement of the mounds looks something like this. So kind of weirdly clumped with a few isolated ones. And so we needed a way to um, kind of um, characterize the spatial arrangement uh, of the mounds. So that way we could compare what we see in the field with what the model predicted. Because clearly if, um, uh, you know, if, if, if the spatial arrangement in, in the model was completely different from what we see in the field, then, then you know, that, that's not a win. And, and that suggests that there's something amiss in the model. <clears throat> and so how do, we, how do we characterize the spatial arrangement of the mounds? Oops. Well, one thing we looked at was the vari variability of spacing between the mounds. So we can have a situation where there's low variability of spacing. So in other words, the, the spacing is quite uniform. And uh, at the other extreme, you could have a situation where there's a lot of variability of spacing between the mounds. So some mounds are very close together, some are far away. And so you know, uh, high variability versus low variability. And you can also look at packing arrangement. So if you think of the way you could pack, say, spheres, you could pack them this way, which is known as um, square packing, because you can imagine drawing a square between the centers of, of the circles. And the other extreme when it comes to packing is um, uh, hexagonal packing, which, which looks like this, where each, each row is offset from the other. So these are uh, kind of the two and members of a, of a packing um, continuum. And so we can plot our data uh, kind of in this, in this space where we have variability of spacing on the x-axis and then uh, packing arrangement on the y-axis. And if you were to just take <clears throat> points randomly distributed in space, they would plot here uh, in, uh, along these two dimensions. OK, so this is just, you know, if you just randomly threw pennies on the ground, this is, uh, you know, and, and, and measured uh, their, um, uh, their spatial distribution according to these two metrics, they would, they would plot somewhere there. The mean amounts from Merced plot here. So as you can see, it's kind of on the low end of spacing variability and right in the middle in terms of square versus hexagonal packing. So um, that's where the Merced data uh, show up. And then when we do the same kind of analysis for the model, it plots perfectly on top of the Merced data. Okay, so, um, 
So in terms of the, the prediction of the spatial arrangement of the mounds, you know, that's a big win. <clears throat> so uh, to kind of wrap this up then, um, it's pretty clear that gophers build these MIMA mounds, you know, the, the numerical model, uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively, makes a lot of predictions that are borne out by, by actual observations in the real world. And another interesting thing about this uh, is that it turns out that the MIMA mounds are the largest structures scaled by body size built by non-human mammals. <clears throat> So if you look at beaver dams, you know, and when you think of things that are built by animals, beaver dams probably seem like the most obvious. If you scale a beaver dam by uh, kind of beaver body weight, you get about a cubic meter of structure per kilogram of beaver. But for gophers, you get 100 times that. You get 100 cubic meters of structure per kilogram of gopher. Now, of course, uh, it's kind of an unfair comparison in a way because the um, you know it takes thousands it takes like you know hundreds of years to, to create a meme mound, um, but here's an interesting thing. Gophers are solitary animals, and so it's just one gopher per mound. So um, uh, you know it's each of those mounds that you saw was built by one gopher just occupying that mound. Uh, but of course, multiple generations over, over hundreds of years. And uh, so that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Manny. <clears throat> cool stuff. Nice to see the combination of uh, field geology and simulations coming together like that. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so first, a uh, I think a really simple one, which is, have you or others observed the gophers actually doing this? So for sure, yeah, you can go to these MIMA mounds and there's gophers, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're quiet, if you're not, uh, and, and if you just kind of sit there for a while, yeah, you'll see the gophers in the mounds. But, but, but like I said, it takes hundreds of years. And so you, you'll never be able to sit there long enough and, and watch a mound actually being built. Right. And so that, you know, that's the advantage of the numerical model is. So the, so the, um, I guess the fair comparison with the beaver dams is um, mass of a gopher times how many generations of gopher contribute to that thing. Yeah, yeah, that'd be, so be yeah. So it'd be, it would be curious to see how that compares with uh, you know, the mass of a single beaver, right? Right. <laughs> right. Um, and then the other thing I, I noticed, I think in some of the photographs, and you alluded to this when you talked about the packing, but it looked like in some places the mounds were very densely packed. And in other places, there was quite a lot of space between them. And so I'm wondering in your, um, in your modeling, what happens that gives rise, or do you see situations that give rise to less packing, right? You talked about how they sort of, um, the, the, um, interplay of material between the mounds kind of self limits yeah, yeah. the sizes of them. But if there's a lot of space between them, couldn't you build one particular one significantly higher or is it just that erosion? Yeah, so what, so what happens is, so um, yeah, so why don't you, how come mega mounds don't, don't form, I think is right. Well. well, so you'll remember that in the, the tracer data, <clears throat> um, soil that was at the top of the mound at 85 centimeters Right. Pushed away from the center of the mound. And, and so that's that's a limiting factor is okay. once you get 85 centimeters, um, you know, they start pushing. Well, the model starts pushing soil downhill. Right. Yeah. And, and as far as the yeah, you bring up an excellent point. Um, as far as the packing goes and, and the self-limiting thing, um, you know, this is kind of what I alluded to, which is that these mounds essentially become agents competing for soil. Right. Uh, and so it seems like that is what uh, determines a lot of their spacing and, and their packing is this competition for resources. Right. And, and, and it's weird to think of these inorganic objects as competing for soil, but you know, over long time scales, that's exactly what they're doing. Right. There's kind of a message about finite resources in here for us, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, let's see, uh, anyone else wanna raise their hand and ask a question? 
Uh, let's see. Someone has a hand up. Let's see who that is. Yeah, Liam. Go ahead, Liam. You can unmute yourself. Um, I, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so uh, this is a really nice talk. Um, I, I had a couple of questions. I might have missed these, but in your, your your mathematical model is like a kind of like a stochastic cellular autonomous uh, type model, right? And I was just curious, uh, one, um, is there like a, a, a kind of continuum analog to this? Like, is there a way that you could have converted this model into some sort of PDE? Um, 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 yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting that you bring this up because if you plug in the equation for soul transport that, that drives the thing, and I showed you the data that I used to calibrate that, if you plug that into the continuity equation, you get the wave equation out of it, which is really mm -hmm. cool because that's what these things look like. You know, they look like two-dimensional waves. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, two dimensions like on the surface, you know. Yep, um, yep. So yeah, so so there there is a way, but but it's um, uh, um, but yeah, but I but I went this way, kind of the cellular the cellular way. Yeah, and and I guess I guess the other question um, is that uh, you know, so, so <clears throat> I'd be curious, like you when you were showing the packing, I didn't quite understand when you're doing like this. You had squares versus hexagons on one axis, and then packing yeah. on another axis. Were you ever like looking at like say uh you know, like, like, like the spectral data, like, like taking the, say, the Fourier transform of the topography, and then, and, you know, which allows you to actually, like, identify, you know, um, characteristic, um, uh, like, hexagonal versus square patterns, because you can see it really easily when you actually look at, look at it in, in Fourier space. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, we had the tools to do that, um, and in fact, one of the guys that I was working with, um, he's done that a lot. He's used Fourier transforms a lot to analyze landscapes. Um, but uh, yeah, we didn't, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, I, I don't remember why, but we, we decided to go kind of in, in this in this other direction. But 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 that but that could be done, yeah. We we could have gone that way, but yeah. Yeah, and then I, I'll, I'll let anyone else answer ask questions they want. But the, the third one I think is connected to Michael's question, which is, you know, there's clearly like a, a characteristic wavelength. Um, between these, um, between these mounds, yeah. you know, you're not just getting like one giant mound in the, in the middle of everything. Right. Um, and there's some length scale that's being selected here. And I was curious, which is obviously much bigger than the gophers, yeah. um, you know, and so there's like, I'm wondering what type of like emergent phenomena might be leading to that, that wave number selection. Yeah. So, so what that was, um, so that that's the weighting function that has to do with basically the line of sight of gophers or their ability to, to see very far. So th there's a weighting function because you can imagine, you know, if you're sticking your head up out of the ground, you're gonna see things, uh, um, you, your, your vision is gonna be blocked by, uh, you know, even small, um, even small mounds around you. You know, they don't, they don't see very far. So I had to kind of calibrate the model to that. Um, and, and, and so that it turns out that that's what determines the spacing is um, how far they can see. So if they can see yeah, very so far, visibility, basically. Yeah, exactly. So if they can see very far, if they can say, oh, hey, there's a mound 20 meters to, my, you know, to the Northwest, I'm gonna start pushing soil there. Then you get really big mounds. But if you have, you know, very nearsighted gophers who can only see, you know, a meter ahead of you, uh, ahead of them, then you get uh, very small amounts, uh, you know. So, so essentially, that's what determines that length scale. Hmm, cool. Now, now, of course, nobody's ever uh, studied gopher vision, uh, and, and this was all. Um, uh, Kind of an assumption I made about what they see and what they don't. So I don't, I don't, I have no idea how realistic that is. But it turns out that that's that's the knob that determines, that's the dial that determines how big the mounds are. Cool. Thank you.
Hey, uh, let's see, Steve Morgan has a question. Steve, go ahead, you can turn your mic on. <clears throat> okay, uh, yes, I was uh, curious whether you considered modeling um, other burrowing animals that have better eyesight and are more social that might create different stru uh, different structures, different size mounds, different spacing, such uh, as yeah. squirrels and ferrets. Yeah, so so it turns out that squirrels, I you know I don't know much about ferrets, but but I I'm, I, I think it's kind of like squirrels. They're less interesting because once they build their burrow, they stop because they're not eating the below ground pile. They're not eating the roots in, in the way that the gophers are. And so the gophers are, um, are, are constantly digging. And so, um, um, and so we don't really have much information about, uh, about squirrel burrowing. Um, it seems to be less dynamic. Um, of, course, of course, there are also lemmings and bulls and moles. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> and, and this kind of, so I, I got interviewed by the BBC for this and, and they're like, oh, so what are you going to work on next? You know, are you, are you going to, are you going to solve the Bigfoot mystery? It's like, well, you know, <laughs> I'm not a cryptozoologist. Um, and and uh, yeah, and so, you know, I, I kind of, I, I kind of stopped here. Um, one of the reasons why is uh, I felt kind of queasy about seeing my name so close to the word rodent all the time. Uh, so I moved on to different <laughs> things. But, uh, but for sure, there's, um, there's a lot of other things that, that could be done. Yeah, you know, and so for example, like termites, termites build big, build big mounds. That would be super interesting. Um, uh, but no, I, you know, I, I, kinda, I kinda left it here. Hey Manny, I was going to follow up with one more, which is um, I was thinking about um, the gopher, where gophers live, right? Yeah. And I guess it's mostly like you can see in this picture, kind of sandy soil, probably pretty arid kind of places. Uh, well, not necessarily, uh, you know. So, like I showed you the picture from Washington State. The oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of in my lawn. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, and, and so the fact that they're building the mounds to get out of the saturated soil suggests mm. that they're more likely to build them in, in areas that get uh, a lot of rainfall. Get it. Okay, got it. So it's the moisture, it, it's the trying to get out from under yeah. the, the water yeah. table, basically. Yeah, you know, and, and once, once you start seeing these, once you get an eye for recognizing these, you're going to start seeing them all over the place. So if you go to UC Santa Cruz, They've got them all over the campus there. Um, got it. You know, if you drive like down I five, you're gonna see them. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll take a look. I was <laughs> I was just thinking about whether is there something about the either the environment that the gophers are in or the gopher behavior that would be different than other animals that would limit other animals' ability to do this. I don't know, but it yeah. sounds like you, you. It's mainly the fact that they're excavators, right? That that they're yeah that they're fossorial so they live right. in soil, and yep. um and, and then we see these things forming in areas where soils get waterlogged. Got it. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we're a few minutes after five p.m. So let's thank Manny again. Awesome talk. Lots yeah, of fun. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, this week I cannot stick around for a happy hour, so uh, I'm going to sign off here in a minute. But um, Thank you all for coming.